Today's version of Faith and Finance Live is actually not live, so don't call in. When a low-income person asks your church for help, what do you do next? Hi, I'm Rob West. God is extraordinarily generous, and our churches should be too. However, helping low-income people often requires going beyond meeting their material needs. Dr. Brian Ficker joins us today to talk about how your church can help the poor in ways that lead to lasting change. And we have some great calls lined up, but we won't be taking your live calls today because we're pre-recorded. This is Faith and Finance Live, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Well, we're delighted to have Brian Fickard back with us today. He's professor of economics and community development and the founder and president of the Chalmers Center for Economic Development at Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. Brian is also the co-author of the best-selling book, When Helping Hurts, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself. Brian, great to have you back with us. Oh, it's so great to be with you folks again today. Thank you. Brian, uh, this is such a key topic. We hear about it so often from church lay leaders and pastors wanting to know how can we be a blessing to those in our community who are in a a desperate situation through a benevolence ministry? Uh, Why is it so important for us to take perhaps a fresh look at how these ministries operate? Well, because so often they're just not working very well, to be honest with you. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, oftentimes uh, churches feel overwhelmed by the needs in their communities. They're not really sure what to do. And they feel frustrated because, you know, they've tried some things in the past and it doesn't feel like it's worked at all. And so the whole situation just seems kind of helpless. Yeah. And so we, we've got to find a better way to do this thing. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And we kind of hear that in people's voices all the time when they call and ask about this. And I know your goal is really to change the way people think and act with regard to benevolence ministries. So before we get into some of the details, what are your guiding principles in this area? Yeah, there, there's so many things, but I, I think if I had sort of one message to try to get across today, it would be this. We're all in this together. You you know, whether we're conscious of it or not, most of us come at this question of benevolence from a framework of superiority. I'm okay, uh, they're not okay, and it's my job to fix them. Hmm. But, but, you know, the biblical story is just different from that. And the the biblical story says that all of us are image bearers of the triune God. That's true whether we're rich or poor, white or black, educated or illiterate. We're all image bearers of God Almighty. And so each one of us has inherent dignity and worth uh, as that image bearer. But then, of course, the fall happens. And, and, you know, it's interesting I don't think that the church right now is doing a very good job of understanding the fall. You know, Mm. uh, uh, there's a tendency for us to reduce the effects of the fall to either, you know, broken individuals or or broken systems. That's a huge controversy that's dividing the church and, quite frankly, the country right now. But, But the Bible actually gives us a very clear answer to 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 this the the fall is comprehensive in scope so it does uh break systems and it does break us inside of ourselves we're sinners and 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 there's more uh because of the fall demons are given greater latitude in the created order and so you know ephesians 2 the first several verses we could summarize saying you know, as the church has said for centuries, that the fall has, has pitted the world, the flesh, and the devil against us. And mm. so the fall is comprehensive. And for some of us, this brokenness due to the fall bubbles up in material poverty. Mm. For other people, this comprehensive brokenness bubbles up in different ways. And so I'm not materially poor, but I've got brokenness from the fall that manifests itself in different sorts of ways. So, for example, uh, you know, I have strong tendencies towards being a workaholic. Hmm. Well, that yeah. doesn't that doesn't result in my material poverty, uh, but it results in other kinds of problems, uh, anxiety, for example, and the effects of anxiety even on my body. And so, so we're all broken. We're all in this together. It just bubbles up in different ways. The hmm. good news of the gospel is that 
there's redemption, that, that Christ's healing brings redemption as far as the curse is found, repairing broken systems, broken individuals, and destroying the work of Satan. Well, that's well said. We're going to apply that to benevolence programs and get into some of the practical details of how your church can approach this right now. Back with Brian Fickard after this. Stick around. Great to have you with us today on Faith and Finance Live. Today we're talking church benevolence with Dr. Brian Fickert. Brian is professor of economics and community development and the founder and president of the Chalmers Center for Economic Development at Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. And Brian, before the break, you were kind of setting the stage for these benevolence ministries that so often where churches want to help just can't figure out how to do that in a way that's loving and that's lasting. So how should they be thinking about church benevolence ministries? You know, uh, one of the most common questions that we get at the Chalmers Center is this. A person comes into our church asking for help with their electric bill or with money to put gas in their car. Should we give them the money or not? Yes. That's an important question. I understand that question. It's a situation that all of our churches face all of the time. We've got to have answers to that question. But I'd suggest to you that the question reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of material poverty and what the solution to such poverty looks like. You know, you know, Western civilization has kind of enculturated all of us to think in very transactional terms. If my hair is too long, I pay somebody to cut my hair. If, if I'm hungry, I pay a restaurant to, to feed me. If I want to watch the Green Bay Packers, I pay for an online subscription. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and so if I don't want this person to be poor anymore, well, I'll give them money. I'll, I'll pay them to not be poor anymore. We're, yes. we're very transactional. But... The human being is actually a very relational creature. You know, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are, are, is a relational being. And, and we are deeply wired for relationship as well with God, with ourselves, with others, and with creation. And so God places human beings in a habitat that's conducive to human flourishing. It's the Garden of Eden. God dwells there. We have intimacy with God, relationship with self, dignity, relationship with others, deep communion between Adam and Eve, relationship with creation, be fruitful and multiply, increase in number, subdue the earth. Eden is the habitat in which the relational creature can flourish. Now, of course, the fall happens, and so we're cast out of Eden. And, and it's really interesting, the entire storyline of Scripture is about how can we get back into the habitat of Eden. The image in Revelation 21 is an image of Eden restored. And, and the local church is supposed to be a foreshadowing of that. And so, so you know, should we pay for the electric bill? Well, you know, I don't know. The, the, the <laughs> point is to, to help people experience yes. Eden restored. Another way of thinking about it is the local church is the family of God. And, and, and so there should be love, presence, acceptance, community, support, accountability. We're inviting people into a family, into a different habitat where they can experience all that it means to be human. And so, so this sort of transactional approach doesn't really even get come close to what it's going to take to actually help restore people to what it means to, to flourish as an image bearer. Sure. Let me give you an example. You, you know, uh, imagine your child is in junior high school and they, they uh, come home every day bleeding because a bully on the playground has beat them up. There's blood dripping out of their nose and there's tears running down their cheeks and they're ashamed and they're embarrassed. They're not sure what to do. Their, their self image is in the tank. They're physically hurting. They don't know what to do. And you reach in your wallet and give them $20 and say, there, mm. uh, solved. Yeah. Well, that's not going to solve the problem because what's going on there is so much more comprehensive that the $20 is, quite frankly, kind of insulting. Mm. And that's what our benevolence policies often look like. Mm. Uh, people come in bleeding and hurting and from all kinds of issues. And we're asking ourselves, should we give them $20 or not? Mm. It's really a far more uh, fundamental set of issues that can't be solved with simply a handout. 
Yeah, that's really helpful, Brian. And and clearly that's what folks want. And this is hard work, what you're describing. Uh, Characterize examples of where you've seen this working and done well. What does it look like? Yeah, it really looks like welcoming people into our families. So imagine that your family is having dinner uh, some night and uh, somebody knocks at the door and uh, you invite them in and they have dinner with you. And it's not just about the food, it's about being together. It's about community. It's about uh, people being known and seen and heard. And, and when dinner is over, you invite them to stay around and, and perhaps you know, play a game with you and your family. And uh, then you invite them to come back uh, uh, a couple nights later. It looks more like that. It's welcoming people into a supportive community that's gonna walk with them across time. It's, it's about relational ministry. And, and folks, this is profoundly difficult. It, it's time consuming. And, and the, the irony in all of this is that Americans who are the richest people on the face of the earth throughout yeah. all of human history, yeah. in many ways are the least capable people in the world of actually helping people in material poverty because we don't have time. Mm. We don't have time for what it takes to actually develop community for ourselves and to welcome others into that community. Uh, it's really helpful, Brian, and I'm sure there's many listening right now saying, boy, I would love that type of transformational benevolence ministry in my church. I just don't even know where to begin to start to build that out. And I know at the Chalmers Center, you all have put that together in the form of an online training class. So describe that program for our listeners. Yeah, it's a course called Helping Without Hurting in Benevolence Ministry. And we've seen God use this course to really help churches to transform their benevolence policies and processes. And so what we do is we walk you through the process of laying the foundation for your ministry, gathering a team to help you, creating processes and procedures to provide that kind of family support that's actually needed. So there's six online sessions. We walk you through some foundation ideas that are quite frankly theological in nature and then through some very practical steps to revise your approach to revise your policies and procedures to bring along a team of supportive people to create that family we were talking about mm. and Brian as you've talked to churches who have deployed this type of benevolence ministry what are you hearing back from them in terms of the big win and opportunity to approach this in a completely different way yeah, the big win is mutual transformation. Yeah. That, that as we start to to really um, dive deep into a more biblical understanding of what a human being is, of what the fall has done to us, and of the good news of the gospel, that, that, that while we were enemies of the cross, Christ died for us, that we were all alienated from God, and that through no righteousness of our own, we've been brought back into God's family and we start the process of healing. That's a mutually transformative story. And so uh, I have found it personally very transformative and I, and I continue uh, to do so as I come to understand the depths of my own brokenness and the good news that God really loves me no matter what all of the time with a never-ending love. And so it's a mutual transformation kind of process. Oh, it's powerful, Brian. Well, I so appreciate you stopping by today. I know this resource is going to be a wonderful blessing to those out there listening who want this type of benevolence ministry in their own church. Grateful for your work, sir, and uh, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, brothers. That's Brian Fickert, founder and president of the Chalmers Center for Economic Development at Covenant College. To learn more and to access this course Brian mentioned, go to chalmers.org. That's chalmers, C-H-A-L-M-E-R-S dot org. Back with more after this. This is Faith and Finance Live with Rob West. Hey, if you hear a phone number mentioned today, please ignore that number and don't call us because today's broadcast was previously recorded. But we think the upcoming information will help you and make you a wise steward of what God's given you. So please 
Stay tuned. You know, often we mention the Certified Kingdom Advisor designation here at Faith and Finance. Uh, This is uh, those men and women who've achieved the highest credential in biblically wise professional financial advice. It's the only industry accepted designation around a biblical worldview of financial decision making. And it's the designation we trust here at Faith and Finance. There's more than 1,500 professionals across the U.S. and Canada that have earned CKA. And so if you're looking for an advisor, perhaps someone to help you with financial planning, somebody to help you prepare your tax return or your estate plan, we would uh, ask that you consider a certified kingdom advisor. You could certainly find a list of CKAs in your area when you visit faithfi.com. That's faithfi.com. And right there at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says Find a Professional. Now, there's a new version of Find a Professional that was just launched that we think will make it even easier for you to find the right professional to journey with you. You see, God's Word is clear that there is wisdom in counsel, the counsel of many. And so we need to seek wise counsel. Well, we want to not only give you great principles and ideas and help on this program each day as we encourage you in biblical financial decision-making, but we know that there's only so far that we can go over the radio or through the app or on the website. And so we want to connect you to that person that can journey with you, that has the fear of the Lord, that's been trained in biblical financial wisdom, that has met high standards and character and competency. You know, that's where the CKA or the Certified Christian Financial Counselor can come in, depending upon your needs. Well, our new Find a Professional tool will give you perhaps a a little bit simpler way to determine exactly what you're looking for. Do you need investment management? Do you need financial planning? Do you need help paying off your debt? Or uh, maybe you need help setting up a budget. You can choose from any of those topics and then uh, be connected with the right list of professionals that will actually serve your needs the most effectively. And we're actually going to be adding another uh, element to that phase two of the new find a professional in the next coming months will actually allow you to say how much you have in the way of assets under management. So you can be assured that you're connected with a certified kingdom advisor that can serve you, but also uh, you'll be able to select whether you want to have somebody who can advise you in traditional investments or faith-based investments. And that way, the list of CKAs that's provided uh, will be ones that you know we know uh, can offer those types of investments. So we really want to do a, uh, an even better job of getting you connected to the right professional, and all of that's coming in the days ahead. But uh, check it out today when you go to faithfi.com and click Find a Professional right there at the top of the page. All right, we're going to be heading back to the phones here in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, though, let me mention something related to your spending plan, because what we know here now, and by the way, um, you know, inflation is obviously, even though it's headed down, we still see, you know, in a couple of key categories, there's still some really challenging places out there with regard to where your costs are up, certainly at the grocery store. We know that continues to be a challenge, obviously, in the, the automobile category. That's challenging. Uh, uh, also, gasoline uh, is is up as well. And so that's putting the squeeze on your budget. Uh, what do you do if you've got kind of a leak, if you will, in your financial life uh, today? How do you rein in that spending? Well, let me mention a few of the, the common budget busters that we see that uh, could be challenging for you. And perhaps if you dial these in, it could help get you closer to balancing that budget, even having some margin so you can accomplish those financial goals that you have. Uh, One would be uh, what I'll call auto-pay memberships. So this is music and movie streaming services that you've put on an auto-pay program that perhaps you've forgotten about if you're not checking your credit card bill every month. Uh, This could also include magazine subscriptions or auto plans like Sirius XM. It could be a grocery delivery program or maybe Amazon Prime or Audible. Uh, you know, these could add up to hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, one of our team members bought a used car whose previous owner had forgotten to cancel the Sirius XM in the car for three years. 
and he didn't even realize he was being charged for it. So I think it's really important that we check our credit card statements, look for those recurring charges that might seem insignificant, and yet when we put them all together, they can add up to quite a bit of money. All right, second, what about daily indulgences? You know, your snack of choice, that daily stop at the coffee shop or the donut place that can take a bite out of your budget. If you just dial those back, that could end up being hundreds of dollars a month, especially with the uh, price of designer coffee these days. All right, third, what about grocery store gimmies? I mean, taking the kids to the grocery store can absolutely result in costly impulse purchases if you're not careful. The best solution is to, well, maybe consider shopping alone. Now, if you have to take the kids to the store, uh, perhaps limit it to one small treat each and then stick to your list. Uh, Next would be overdriving. Here's what what I mean by that. You know, in these days of high gas prices, making extra trips can really add to your daily costs. So instead of running your errands on impulse, maybe take a few moments at the beginning of the day to plan your trips. Combine the errands uh, as much as possible. Carpool when you can. Even arrange to work from home an extra day if you can. And maybe look at where you know you're going to be just based on the kid's schedule for the day and plan your errands to intersect with the various places you'll be in town. Uh, One last one, your leaky house could be draining your finances. Keeping up with home maintenance, including those drafty windows and doors, can save a lot of money over time. Listen, here's what God's Word says. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful in much. Hopefully these will help you rein in that spending. All right, we're going to head to a break, so don't go anywhere. Still a lot more to come, even though we're away from the studio today and you shouldn't call in. We have some great questions that you're really going to enjoy as we continue to apply God's wisdom to your financial decisions. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us today on Faith and Finance Live. I'm Rob West. Our team is out of the studio today. We're not here, so don't call in, but we have some great questions we lined up in advance. We'll look forward to those. But before we go to the phones, let's take a couple of emails. By the way, you can send us an email at any time, quickly and easily at moodyradio.org slash finance. That's moodyradio.org slash finance. This first one comes from Sue. She writes, uh, my husband and I inherited a sum of money. We're wondering if it's wrong to tithe on this to several different Christian organizations with the bulk going to our church, or should the entire amount go to our church? Well, first of all, Sue, I'm delighted to hear that with this inheritance, you want to give to the Lord, and that's great. We should be givers. We see that throughout the Old and the New Testament. Now, I say the tithe is a great guideline for our giving. Remember, we're not under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ. So giving in the New Testament, I think Jesus takes it to an even higher standard. He says we're to give proportionate. Remember, to whom much is given, much is required. We're to give sacrificially. We look to the poor widow who gave out of her poverty to see that. Jesus commended her in her giving. Uh, We're to give freely. We're also to give cheerfully. Remember, we're not to give under compulsion. So this is not about checking a box or, uh, you know, somehow complying with God's law. It really should be an overflow of our gratitude to God, an act of worship, and a way that we participate with him and his activity. Now, there's no doubt that the local church is God's plan A. So I think we ought to support our giving there first. And so I like the idea of the guideline of the tithe, that is a tenth on the increase, starting with the local church. Now, how might you approach this inheritance if you want to tithe on it, give an increase, uh, a tenth on the increase? Well, I'd probably look to the local church, but if you really felt like you wanted to spread it out beyond your local church, I think that's ultimately between you and your husband and the Lord. That's really uh, not a, a right or wrong decision. So I think if that's where you all come down, that's absolutely appropriate in my view. And I just love that you're giving as unto the Lord. So thanks for writing to us today. All right, let's go back to the phones. We are going to head to Arkansas next. Uh, Bo, thanks for your call today. You can go right ahead, sir. Yeah. Hey, real quick. Um, I was uh, left some money by my parents, and I wanted to be a good steward. 
with that money. So I had two questions. Number one, is CD still the best way to keep it conservatively in there and just using those like ladder CDs? Or is there something better given the fact that, you know, I want to grow it so that down the road I can, um, you know, dispense it to various missions and things like that. So uh, what, yeah. what would be some of your advice to do? Well, I love this question, Bo, and, and I'd like, if you don't mind, to just back up for a second and talk about this money before we even begin to talk about investing options, because, you know, money is should be allocated according to our values and our priorities. So we step back, and I think even before we get to the goals, we say, what is God doing in our lives? What What is most important to me? How do I want to use this money? And once we think and pray through that, then the actual strategies and ultimately the tools or the investment vehicles kind of come out of that. So as you just look at this, obviously this is money that's been gifted to you. You know, that may carry with it certain desires that you have to use it in certain ways. You've obviously mentioned a desire to give. I love that. But give me a little bit more clarity just around, first of all, how much are we talking about? And then second, what is how you'll, you know, how do you ultimately see this being used and in what time period? Well, it's uh, it's a uh, 1.5. Okay. Million. So, and the main thing is about that is just, I don't need it because I've been working and I still work. So I'm blessed that it's not for me to, you know, retire early and just kick back and and go, Hey, I'm going to go play golf 36 holes a day, that kind of thing. But I do want to know number one, how, because it's all God's money anyway, how to be the best steward of that and to be able to benefit people that we have already. We blessed a lot of different people uh, to help them, whether it's education, whether in personal finance, that that their needs to be met short term. But I'm just looking at trying to figure out um, whether the market, you know, there's another concept that I have a friend of mine who told me, he goes, you know, best way to beat the devil is think of what the devil would do, do it, make money and then give it back to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I love that you want to be generous with this, Bo. I mean, I think that's phenomenal. Yeah. I also love that you're talking about something that we talk a lot about here on this program. And that is this idea of a financial finish line. You know, it's not about right. just the mindless accumulation of wealth for wealth's sake. And I would also yeah. affirm the idea that you're describing here around your work life, which is, you know, it's not a matter of saying, okay, we do mundane work work and we kind of drudge through it during our working life so that someday we can do something of significance or value or we can relax. I mean, that's not God's design. He created us to be workers, to find enjoyment in the work because we're using our skills and our abilities as unto the Lord, and you're providing or meeting needs of other people. And so you're, you know, meeting the needs of of your customers and your suppliers and your wholesalers. And I mean, this is God's virtuous cycle of work. And we were created to be workers. We, there was not a, a design on God's part that we should work 65 years and then sit on the front porch. Now, there's nothing wrong with the rhythm of rest and leisure. It's a part of God's original design, but it was one day of seven. It wasn't all the days, right? So I think we're created to be workers, and I think we need to, you know, define those, the enough line. And I think, you know, that's what you're doing here. And when you do that, you free yourself up to do some pretty hilarious giving. I guess the question I would have for you is, I like the idea of investing this so that we can create an engine for giving, but why wait to do, you know, all of that giving down the road? Is there some giving you want to do right up front? Yes, I already have. That's why I'm saying okay. this is this is a second bulk. This Got is it. the second part where. Okay. Um, and and the reason I I mention this is there was a great book years ago that I got to read, John Piper's "Don't Waste, Don't yes, Waste Your, your life. life," which yeah. is hits it hits you like right in the forehead because, you know, talks about people who work 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 then retire on a yacht and like really is that what God wanted you to do and and really honestly when you think about it. It's a very short period of time we have on Earth. That's right. So if we can do all the stuff we can. Obviously, I'm a firm believer of don't go try saving everybody in the world if you yeah. haven't 
talk to your own family and, yeah. and the core about the Lord. Because yeah. he's going to ask you one day, he goes, I didn't ask you to go to missions all over the world and you neglected your family. Go to your family first. Yeah. Make sure they're all on the same page, and then spread out. Like when you throw a pebble into the water, That's it right. goes from the center outward. Yeah. Well, let me offer a suggestion here, Bo. I love the approach you've taken here. Um, one option would be to put this into either all of it or a significant portion of it, what's called a donor-advised fund. Are you familiar with that term? Not at all. Okay. So think of this like a charitable checking account. And what happens is, as soon as you put it in the donor advised fund, you're giving it away at that moment. So you get to go ahead and take the full deduction. And then you'd use a donor advised fund sponsor that shares your values. So let me throw out the one that I would recommend, and that is the the National Christian Foundation. So you'd put the, let's say, the 1.5 in. It's, it could be invested inside the donor advised fund, but guess what? Now there's no taxes as it grows, and then anytime you want to make a gift out of it, you log in online, type in the name of the charity or your church, click a button, and it's gone. So this could be a great tool. Let's do this. I've got to take a quick break. Uh, you and I can finish up off the air, and Rodney, we're coming your way after the break as well. We'll be right back on Faith and Finance. Stick around. This is our final segment of a Faith and Finance Live program that we previously recorded. Thanks so much for being with us today, and we hope you'll stick around and enjoy the rest of the program. Before the break, we were talking to Bo about this money that he's received as an inheritance. He's saying, listen, I don't plan to stop working. God's made me to be a worker. I've got this money that's been gifted to me. It's over a million dollars. I don't need it. I've been working. I've been saving. Uh, I've defined enough. I want to give it away, but I'd like to invest it and give it away over time. And I actually want to see a return on the money, which is going to allow me to give even more. Uh, We had a chance to talk off the air for me to give him a little bit more information about a donor advised fund. But, you know, this is one of my favorite giving tools that's often either overlooked or just unknown because in a sense, it allows you to make the current contribution now. So let's say he, for the sake of round numbers, puts a million dollars in his donor advised fund. He gets the the ability to claim that against his taxes and however the IRS will let him do that over time. But he's giving the million dollars all in one uh, year to his donor advised fund. Now, he's given it away. So what's his role? Well, the donor advised fund sponsor holds on to it, and then he's able to recommend grants from the donor advised fund to his ministry or charity of choice, as long as it's a 501c3 not-for-profit. So the gift coming out of the donor advised fund originates with the original donor, the person who put it in that donor advised fund. Now, it's his fund, the one that he created, at the donor advised fund sponsor. And so from that point forward, it gets invested so it can grow. And then whenever he wants to grant it out to a 501c3, he logs in online, uh, does a quick search for that ministry or charity, and it pops up on the screen. He says, I want to grant out 50000 clicks the button, and the donor advised fund sponsor then releases the money in either check or electronic form to the charity of choice. Uh, so it's just a really fabulous tool And it's tax advantage because those investments inside the donor advised fund are now growing without any tax implication because it's inside a a charitable tool or structure. Uh, The place to go to learn more, and they can even help advise you on the actual gift recipients as well if you need it, is the National Christian Foundation. It was founded by Larry Burkett and Ron Blue. And um, a a gentleman named uh, Terry Parker, who is an attorney, uh, they've given away billions of dollars. In fact, they give away billions every year. Um, But it's all designed to be a resource to the giver. They don't formulate their own giving strategies. It's really just helping God's people give their money away in a tax-efficient and wise manner. And so uh, check it out today. Um, NCF calls their donor advised fund a giving fund. And when you visit their website at ncfgiving.com, that's ncfgiving.com, you can read all about a a giving fund, and it's quick and easy to set up there right on the homepage. All right, we're going to head back to the phones here in our final segment. We'll take as many calls as we can. Uh, Let's go to Missouri. Rodney, thanks for your patience. Go ahead. 
Yes, thank you for taking my call. Yeah, I'm turning 65 this summer, and I'm starting to look at the supplements, and I'm particularly interested in the uh, Christian option like MediShare, and I just wonder if you had some general information about yes. these supplements. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so basically, um, you know, the medical sharing programs are great. Um, we happen to like Christian Healthcare Ministries just because they're the oldest and the biggest. They've uh, shared out over ten billion dollars. We've even got some team members here at FaithFi that uh, have used them, and it's been wonderful. Uh, now you need to sign up, of course, for Medicare when you turn sixty-five. You're going to have three months before and after the month you turn sixty-five to do that. And if you don't, you'll permanently raise your premiums if you sign up later. Now, Medicare C is what's known as Medicare Advantage, um, and you may decide to go with a medical sharing program instead of Medicare Advantage, but you have to sign up for basic Medicare during your open enrollment window. So what I would do is do a cost comparison between the medical sharing costs and the Medicare Advantage premiums. Uh, so there is going to be some math involved. Now, Medicare Advantage is, of course, different from Medigap, which is going to fill the gaps in the parts A and B. You can't have both, so you'd choose one or the other. Um, the Medicare Advantage plans are offered by private Medicare-approved insurers, and they're an alternate to the original Medicare A and B that also include additional coverages to fill the gaps. Uh, you can also get the Part D prescription drug benefit through Medicare Advantage as well. And I would say usually the Advantage is better for someone who doesn't go to the doctor a lot, generally healthy. The Medigap, usually better for folks with chronic conditions or if you require a lot of doctor visits, although it can be a bit more expensive. So I think the next step perhaps here, Rodney, other than signing up for Medicare in that six-month window before and after you turn 65, is to reach out to, in my recommendation, it'd be Christian Healthcare Ministries, just to have them explain to you what additional, uh, you know, offerings they would bring to the table alongside Medicare, and then you can see that cost, and then compare that to either the Medicare Advantage or the Medigap. Is that helpful? All right. Well, that'll help me out. Just just needed some general information so I could start the search. Awesome. Very good. Well, chministries.org is the place to go, Rodney, and they'd be delighted to chat with you and, and help you understand all of the uh, the options you have in front of you. But listen, all the best to you. What are you most looking forward to in this next season of life? Oh, I don't know. Just enjoying the, just enjoying life. <laughs> okay. You Sounds good. You have to work every day. Yeah, I hear you. Well, uh, very good, uh, Rodney. Hey, let's do this. Stay on the line. I'm going to send you a gift for being on the program today. It's a book called An Uncommon Guide to Retirement, Finding God's Purpose for the Next Season of Life. I think it'll be a blessing to you, and uh, we'll send it to you on behalf of our team here at Faith Fi as our gift. All right? All right. Thank you very much. Excellent. Stay on the line. We'll get it in the mail to you. Thanks for calling. Hey, let me touch on a topic that we tackle uh, or we hear about. It's asked about often on this program, and it has to do with subsidizing adult children. Uh, you know, this is a, a real challenge for a lot of folks because, number one, it can get messy uh, if you've got multiple children and you kind of get stuck in financial favoritism, helping one over another. Uh, you know, they you may prevent them by subsidizing them from developing their own skills. Uh, that can be a challenge. Um, you know, it can increase dependency on you, so that could delay financial maturity. Uh, you could be supporting unwise uh, lifestyle choices and even encouraging bad financial habits. I think from a spiritual perspective, often throwing money at a struggling child can shield him or her from hardship, which actually may be God's way of getting their attention. I think the last issue that comes up often that I see is the question of can you even really afford to provide the subsidy you're providing. You know, a person in the 30s or 40s has a lot of options for generating income, but as you're heading into retirement, you don't have that flexibility. So diverting your resources to your adult children could jeopardize even your own financial future. So what do you do about it? How do you approach this? Well, let me give you just some really practical ideas uh, that you uh, perhaps should consider prayerfully uh, before you launch into subsidizing adult children. Number one, just what I said, ask the Lord for guidance. 
Uh, pray. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom. This requires a lot of discernment. Uh, second, remember there's nothing wrong with including your kids in your long-term financial plans. But when the unexpected happens and you decide to help, have a frank conversation with them before making any financial commitment. Uh, insist on financial accountability and transparent communication. Uh, I would also say before you extend help, clarify your financial expectations. You know, the goal is for your child to be living within their means and on a budget as much as possible before you extend any financial assistance. Uh, Next, give any financial gift a timeline so they know the help is temporary. Put it in writing. Now, this may feel uncomfortable, but remember, good stewardship requires accountability and uh, clear communication. We don't want to have unmet expectations that could result in a damaged relationship. So it helps everyone to have the plan in writing. That's going to avoid miscommunication. And then I would also say point your children to places where they can get wise counsel. They may be able to solve their own money problems on their own with outside the family help. Uh, Lastly, let me just say, look for ways to give in a way that allows you to reinforce the right behavior. So maybe they've gotten stuck and they ran up some credit card debt and you want to help. Maybe you match every payment to the creditor instead of, uh, you know, you uh, just giving them a financial gift that they may or may not use wisely. Uh, If it's getting them out of the house and into their own place, maybe you charge them rent just to have that accountability and responsibility. And without you telling them, you're taking that rent, putting it in a savings account, and the day they move out, you bless them with a gift to get started. I mean, these are ways that we can reinforce the right behaviors, and that can make all the difference. Hey, I hope this helps you as you think through this really challenging topic of financial assistance for adult children. Before we wrap up quickly today, William in Virginia, how can I help you, sir? Yes, sir. Um, I've been praying and trying to figure out what to do with my life now that I've been forced into retirement. I've been here for a while, and I've been struggling with it, trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. Mm. And I heard you talking to the gentleman, a couple of people before, and he, you, were, you said there was a book. And I, I have been earnestly praying for the last week or so, trying to figure out, you know, saying, God, what do you want me to do with this, with this retirement? I love it. So I'm going to send you to, uh, two places. Number one is, I don't think it was by accident you heard the broadcast today. I'm going to send you a copy of this book as well, William. So stand in line. It's called An Uncommon Guide to Retirement, Finding God's Purpose for Your Next Season of Life. Read it. Ask the Lord to give you some wisdom. I think it'll be a real encouragement. I also want to encourage you to check out an organization called Halftime, halftime.org. You'll find them on the web. Stay on the line. We'll get this book right out to you. All the best, sir. Thanks for calling today. That's going to do it for us. So thankful for my team today, Amy, Dan, and Jim. Thank you for being here as well. Faith and Finance Live is a partnership between Moody Radio and Faith Fi. I hope you have a great rest of your day and come back and join us next time. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.